There's homework in this class? Just kidding. Um, okay, well, um, then I'm just going to do one more 2D example. And then we'll go on to some new stuff. Okay, so uh, let's say there's a pin joint that connects a long beam to the ground. And um, the top of the beam is in contact with a wall. And this wall up here is at an angle of 80 degrees with the horizontal. And this is an angle of 60 degrees. Uh, the mass of this beam is 100 kilograms. And the length is half a meter. Zero point five meters. What are the reaction loads on the beam? Um so we're going to use Newton's laws on the beam. So we have to draw a free body diagram of the beam. Um, the loads acting are the weight, which always acts at the center of mass. So that's 100 times 9.81. Did I do this one? It feels like deja vu. OK, good. I just always use 100 kilo. I use 100 kilograms so often. Um, okay, so there's the weight force, and now we go around the boundary looking for contact with the outside world. Um, what kind? So one of those contact points is the pin joint at the left end. Uh, what kind of load is applied by a pin joint in two dimensions? Well, I'm glad you don't remember. You remember, but Let's pretend no one does. Uh, so now we're going to think through it because you don't have to remember this stuff. You can sort of you can think through what the loads are applied by a joint. Um, so there are three degrees of freedom. If that thing's just hovering in space, it can move in three ways. It can move along any axis you choose, an axis perpendicular to that first one that you chose, and it can rotate. So that pin joint, does it let this point in any direction? No, it can't move in any direction. So that means that there's a full vector of forces there, okay? So there's an X and a Y component of forces that locks that in place. Now think about the rotation. Uh, is this thing free to rotate around that pin? Yeah, I mean, it's not because this is here. But when you think about the joint itself, you're just imagining that the joint is the only thing it's connected to. Could this thing rotate? Yes, it can. And so there's no couple provided. And so um, a pin joint applies a full vector of forces. And I'll call that R for reaction. And then up here, uh, what kind of load is applied by the Okay, well, first we have to think, is this a friction force or a frictionless force? I didn't say anything that would really tell you. Um, one thing, uh, in order for this to slide along the surface, you know, friction only 
actually happen with something as free as slide. For that to slide along the surface, the length of this thing would have to change. So friction, so you can always, in a case where something's a rigid body is leaning against something, you can always assume it's frictionless. Um, and then I'll talk about another way to think about this, that after this problem's over. So a frictionless contact, uh, what kind of loads does that apply? Normal, N, yep, <laughs> starts with an N. Um, so it only applies a force that's perpendicular to the surface. So if that's the surface, then the force is like that. It's not quite horizontal. Um, and that means that in looking at this normal force, we have to think about, you know, we're going to have to use trigonometry to come up with a unit vector in that direction. Maybe you can just eyeball it in this case, if that angle's 80 degrees, uh, then. Um, but you can also think of it this way. I keep trying to, you know, bring up this idea. There's a systematic way that you can find these angles if, if you can't, you know, if you look at one and you just can't tell right off the bat. Um, so the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to start out at the positive x-axis, okay? I'm going to rotate to a vector that's this way along the line of the surface, you know? And then the vector that I drew here is another 90 degrees from that. So, this angle, the benefit of doing that here is that this angle is actually given on the figure. Okay, so you go, so theta, oops. We're gonna go counterclockwise 80, and then counterclockwise another 90. So that's 170 degrees. And then that way of doing it tells you that you're 10 degrees from the horizontal if you didn't see that right away. And so um, that force vector is n times cosine of 170, n times sine of 170, which is negative 0.985 uh, n uh, positive 0.174 n. Um, and now we can go to Newton's second law. Uh, no, not be so hasty. Go to that table. Um, so rho force moment. Uh, we have to choose an about point. I think probably the easiest one in this case is down here, but it doesn't matter. You can choose any point you want. Um, so if my first load that I'm dealing with is that force itself, that R reaction force, what's the row vector, the vector from the about point to where R is applied? This is an easy one. Yeah, right. Whoever says the easy one doesn't have to say the hard ones later. Um, so yeah, zero, zero. And um, this time, you know, for my example so far, I've been keeping all three dimensions of all the vectors, but then a whole bunch are zero. This time I'm just gonna keep the ones that are non-zero for a two-dimensional problem. But remember that what it implies is three-dimensional vectors where uh, all the forces and the row vector are X and Y non-zero, and the moment vectors are Z non-zero. 
Okay, so we got zero, zero. The force vector is R, X, R, Y. Now cross product is just this times this minus this times this, which is zero. Uh, next is the weight force. This whole thing has a length of 0.5, so the length from here to here is 0.25. Um, and so it's 0.25 times cosine and sine of 60 degrees. Which is point. Point two five times cosine and sine of 60 degrees. Well, the first one is 0.125. And the second one is 0.217. And then the force that's in the negative y direction. So 0, negative 981. Um, and then, uh, so the cross product is 0 0.125 times 0 0.981, which is negative, uh, 120, uh, 124.25, is that right? One, one, two, oh. 122.6. And then the normal force, um, that's just going to be twice this one. That's 0 0.5 times cosine and sine is 60 degrees. So 0 0.25, 0 0.433. The force vector is negative 0.985n, 0.174n, and so the cross product is 0.25 times 0.174n minus 0.433 times, uh, well, negative 0.985n, and I think you get uh, point four, positive point four seven n. Think about the signs, by the way, just for practice, for for understanding the how the directions of couples work. Think about the signs of those moments. So uh, the moment you're using my R is zero. Weight force, if you apply the force that way, and this thing is free to move around this pin, around this point that we chose to be about point, it would rotate clockwise. So that's negative. So that sign makes sense. And then this force N, if you apply the force this way and it was free to move around here, it would rotate counterclockwise. So that sign makes sense. And we know that N has to be positive. So we know that moment's going to come out positive. And now once you have this table, you have everything there in place. And I think one of the nice things about doing this is if you get your answer and something doesn't look right, you just have everything that every part of your calculation is still sitting there. You know, you can go back and make one correction to one part of your table without like having to go back and redo everything, you know. So uh, for Newton's second law, We have Rx, Ry, plus 0, negative 981, plus negative 0.985 n, positive 0.174 n, and it's not accelerating, so these have to add up to 0.
and then the moment equation says negative 122.6 plus 0.47 n is equal to zero. This isn't too hard to just solve by substitution, but I'm gonna write this out in the matrix just so you have a lot of stuff in your notes about this for as you're getting used to it. So uh, I'm gonna write out this matrix. Uh, it's gonna have three rows, one for each equation. It's gonna have four columns, one for each variable and one then an extra one for the constant. So four rows, three, no, three rows, four columns. The rows are equations one, two, and three. The columns are, first of all, the variables. So um, Rx, Ry, and N. And then the last one is the constants. And remember those constants have to be alone on the other side of the equation. If you leave the constants on the same side of the equation as the variables, your answers come out negative opposite. Um, so equation one says uh, Rx's we have one, Ry's we have zero, N's we have negative 0.985, and there's no constants. Equation two, uh, Rx's we have zero, Ry's we have one, N's we have positive 0.174, and constants, when you move it to the other side, we have 981. And then the third equation, uh, no Rx's, no Ry's, um, N's we have 0.47, and the constant when you move it to the other side is positive 122.6. And I think I have this written here. Um, it gives, well, I'll do it in this order. It gives answers of Rx equal to 256.99, Ry 935.6, and those are in Newtons, and then N uh, 26, uh, sorry, 260.90. And that's also in Newtons. If anyone gets something different, let me know. Um, okay, is there anything about these answers that can uh, that we can use as sort of a sanity check? Anything we can do intuitively, you know? Well, the first thing that jumps out is uh, this pushing contact has to be in this direction. So if we got a negative value for n, it would mean the wall was pulling in on the on the beam and that can't happen. So it's good that we got this positive answer for N. The other stuff is a little harder to visualize, but um, you know that, yeah, I, maybe I won't even think through it. Um, but yeah, those, those normal forces on pushing contacts always have to be positive. Okay, you always know the direction. Okay, I want you to notice something. In every problem we've done so far, and these have all been 2D problems, Have you noticed that there's been a consistent number of variables we've solved for? Um, we've always solved for three variables. Um, 
you could have two dimensional problems where like, for example, if nothing's happening in the X direction, then you have an X equation that's just zero equals zero and you end up solving for two variables. But um, in 2D, there are only, so we only have three equations. So if a single rigid body has four or more unknown loads, then it's not a matter of trying to figure out how to solve it. It's impossible to solve. You know, you can't solve for four variables with three equations. Um, it can't be solved. In that case, the problem would be referred to as statically indeterminate. Indeter me, yeah. Okay, statically indeterminate means you can't solve it using statics alone. Okay, so let's think about a case where um, Let's think about changes that could happen to this problem. Yes. Okay. That's fine. There will be some problems where I'll ask you to redraw the free body diagram with the loads on it. But most of the time, yeah, I just want you to, you can write it out as the components of the vectors or uh, as vectors and then. I'm pretty flexible most of the time. No, you can just leave the, I can see what your variables refer to in your work. Uh, okay, so think back to this problem and let's make a change to this problem that makes this statically indeterminate. Uh, one way you could make this statically indeterminate is to make to say that this is a friction convex. You see that? Because then you have two uh, variables here and two more variables here. That's four total variables, and you can't solve it. And so sometimes, like when I said before, well, this is a rigid body leaning against this thing, so it's never going to be sliding, so you can ignore friction. But sometimes you'll just make assumptions because you have to make certain assumptions in order to get any answers out of it. Another way this could be statically indeterminate is if instead of a pin here, we made this a fixed joint, a weld joint, you know? And the idea is it's over constrained. Uh, so this thing could be held in place by a fixed joint alone, or it could be held in place if that fixed joint was a pin joint. And then we don't know how much of it being held in this position is being done by the couple at the fixed joint and how much is being held by the wall. If you think about what determines how much is done by each of those things, it's largely determined by the deformation of this thing. Does this thing deform really easily or does it, is it really difficult to deform? That'll, you know, if it's made out of diamond, like perfectly rigid, um, then, this, then the couple here can could support all of that load. If it's really flexible, then that couple couldn't, you know, this thing is going to sag a little bit, and then that wall is going to support more. 
And so when you get into D form, um, we'll get into problems that are statically indeterminate. It turns out that statically indeterminate just means from the statics alone, you don't have enough equations to solve it. But if you have the equations that represent its deformation, you can add more equations and you can solve things like that, you know? And you know there are a lot of cases in civil engineering and any kind of engineering that are over-constrained where like a bridge, for example, um, things are bolted into place, but then there's a lot of different uh, members to support the loads. It's statically indeterminate that way, but um, you can do those calculations by including the deformation. So anyways, that's not important to this class, but that's coming soon, you know. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is equipollent systems. Um, and the idea of equipollent systems is in rigid bodies, and they do have to be rigid bodies, uh, you have to be treating them as rigid bodies. You can't be treating them as flexible bodies. Um, the existing loads can often be replaced by a different set of loads. And first of all, why would you even want to do that? Well, the idea is that um, in some cases it makes the calculation a little easier. without changing the behavior. Um, and I'm gonna talk about three of these. Uh, well, right now I'm only, I'm gonna bring up three and then I'm gonna talk about one of them. But the first one is, uh, one that we're already getting pretty used to. Um, if you have a couple, and remember the, the real technical definition of a couple is two equal and opposite forces acting at a distance. You can replace a couple with a moment, okay? What you're doing there is you're taking the loads that are actually occurring and replacing it with a new set of loads that's just makes your job easier. Um, we already use this one. The second one is um, any set of loads can be replaced by a single force vector acting at a point you choose. That's kind of the amazing thing. and a couple. Um, we're not going to use this, and I'm not going to talk about it, but uh, it'd be easier, easy to find the formula online or in any textbook, any statics textbook you look at. Um, 
but we won't use this. But it's not hard. And then the third one, the one I'm going to talk about right now, is um, sorry. A force acting at one point. can be replaced by the same force acting anywhere along its line of action. Um, so here's an example. Uh, if this is the object we're talking about, and a force vector acts on it here, the line of action is the line that's parallel to the force vector and goes through the point where it applies. And so mathematically, um, you can move where this force is applied to here or here or here, okay? And mathematically, obviously this doesn't make any physical sense, but mathematically it works perfectly well to, um, to move this force off the body. So it's applied here or here or wherever, okay? Where, anywhere that makes the math easier to calculate, as long as it's along that line of action, you can move the force there. Um, so here's something to think about for a second. Um, why, why does this only apply to rigid bodies? Why does this only work for rigid bodies? And this is true of all equipolent systems. So by this, I mean any equivalent system. Why does it only work for rigid bodies? Um, so imagine, you know, a body made out of Play-Doh or Silly Putty or something that's deformable. Um, and say that you have a force applied uh, here. Okay, so the line of action is this, okay. Um, well, since we're doing calculations involving deformation of this material, If that force is applied there, it causes a certain kind of deformation. And that's not the same as if we moved it along its line of action to this other edge of the material. Okay. 
Oops. But in this class, we're not doing analyses of deformations, and so we'll always be able to use equiponents. Okay. Anybody have any questions about this yet? Okay. Um, so let me do an example. Let's say, uh, so there's this guy working out in his basement, um, doing this like planking type thing. That's how much he hates exercising. Last week I was in, I told my kids, I'm like, I'm gonna go downstairs and exercise. And uh, the older one is like, dad, exercise. And the little one is like, dad, those two words do not go together. And that made me feel good. Okay, and let's say, um, so uh, what do we have going on here? Let's say we know that this distance from here to the floor is 0.8 meters. Um, and let's say that we know that this person's mass is 80 kilograms. Um, and Let's say that we know that the person's center of mass is somewhere along this line. So we don't know the height of it, but we do know that we do know that the distance horizontally from the center of mass to the contact is 0.5 meters. Okay, we don't know the height though. Um, and okay, let's calculate the reactions. And we're gonna use this uh, idea of moving uh, the force along the line of action. The first thing is in a, in a problem that's not, that doesn't use actual like, engineered joints, you know, like this contact between the shoe and the floor. Um, sometimes you have to work a little bit to, to figure out a, a way to represent that as an engineering joint. So let's think a little bit about how we want to represent that contact. Okay. What are some possibilities? Well, the the foot being there definitely restricts all translation of the foot unless it slips. So we're going to assume that, so we're definitely going to assume there's a F, X, and Y force, right? Um, what about rotation? It probably resists rotation. I mean, he, he can resist rotation a little bit with his toes, right? Do we want to, do we want to treat that as being able to resist that rotation? And how do we know whether we do or don't? The answer comes from what else is going on, because we know that in a two-dimensional problem like this, we only have three equations. So we can't have more than three variables. So we know that's just going to multiply. So that's one variable. So we can only apply, we can only use two variables in the course. Okay? And so if you think like, okay, that's the moment provided by your toes is probably small compared to the resistance to rotation applied by that force. Then you think like, okay, <clears throat> excuse me, I can probably get a pretty good answer to this problem by just treating that as a friction contact that can't apply a moment and, and treating that as a force. So that's what we're gonna do.
you won't have to worry about stuff like that in this class, but um, if you ever just looking at something going on outside or for, you know, a project or something, it's not totally well defined what those joints are. That's the kind of thinking you have to do, you know. Um, so we'll call this a friction contact. Um, and now I'll do a free body diagram. Okay. Um, so what forces are applied? There's a weight force at the center of mass. That's 80 times 9.81.48. Oh, 784.8. And then at the toes, there's a friction contact. So that's an unknown force. I'll just call that R vector. And then there's a normal force here. Um, and I'll just call that N. And now we'll go to the table. And what we're gonna see when we go to the table is there, there are a lot of components of row vectors that we don't know, you know? Um, the row force moment. Um, so first I'll do the R vector. Uh, and let's put the about point here. So the row vector for, the, for R is zero, zero. The force is Rx, Ry. And moment is zero. And now the weight force. Um, so what's the flow vector? That's, it's the vector that goes from the about point to where that force is applied. We know what it is horizontally, but we don't know what it is vertically. Okay. So is that going to be a problem? It's not because you can move this along its line of action. So let's just move it down to, if we call this the origin, let's just move it down to here, you know? And then that row vector uh, becomes 0 0.5, 0. That's right, yep, that's exactly why. Uh, the force vector is zero, negative 784.8. And then the cross product is 392.4. Uh, negative, yep. Um, and then the normal force, uh, what's the row vector from the about point to where this force is applied? Well, just like we can, you know, we don't know the horizontal distance, but just like we can move the weight force along its line of action, we can move that normal force along its line of action. And so um, that's just 0, 0 0.8. The, the force vector is in the negative x direction, so negative n, 0. And so the cross product is positive 0.8n.
and then Newton's second law. Uh, we have Rx, Ry plus zero, negative 784.8. Plus negative n zero is equal to zeros. Um, and then the moment equation says negative three ninety two point four plus point eight n is equal to zero. So n is 392.4 divided by 0.8. What do you get for that? Well, bet I have it. 490.5. Oh. And um, then we can plug that in here. Uh, this R vector, um, the X component is just, uh, sorry, the Y component is 784.8. And the X component is 490.5. Once you have those forces, then you could go and figure out what kind of materials those shoes would have to be made out of for it to provide enough friction for it not to slip or things like that. Um, but when we do friction contact in this class, we never worry about normal forces and coefficients of friction and stuff. You could go back afterwards and do that if you want to know something about the specific material. Um, okay, so now we're going to go on to 3D joints. Yeah, please. Um, just if you solve this, you know, it's 0.8 n is equal to positive 392.4. Yeah, right. And uh, if you ever make a you know, on a test, you're rushing or whatever. Um, you accidentally look at that and say n is equal to negative 490.5. That's why it's always useful to go back to the problem and ask yourself, does it make sense that I got a negative answer for n? In this case, since the wall's pushing on it, we know it's in that direction. And so that would be a red flag that you made a mistake somewhere. Okay. Okay, 3D joints. Um, so, basically, we're going to, we'll proceed like we did with 2D joints. Um, we're going to start with joints that apply one load. And then we'll, you know, go up from there to ones that apply two loads, three loads, all that stuff. Uh, but first I have to say a couple things about three-dimensional motion. And that thing I want to say is the following. Oh, okay. So, three dimensional, but first. Um, in three dimensional motion, An object whose motion is unrestricted
has six degrees of freedom. How many was it for two dimensional? Three, right. Okay, so if you have a object like this, and your coordinate system is this, um, you can translate along three axes. And you can rotate about three axes. OK, so let's uh, visualize these three axes of rotation. So first, uh, for this thing to rotate about the x-axis is like a barrel roll, you know? Rotate about the y axis is like this, and to rotate about the z axis is like this. Okay, anybody want me to slow down on visualizing those rotations? Um, so now let's think about the signs like, what does it mean? For, um, so we're going to think about these rotations in terms of the right-hand rule. Okay. So if you have a positive rotation about the x-axis, okay, what that's saying is your thumb is in the direction of the x-axis, and your fingers rotate in the you know curl in the direction of the rotation. So if this thing was, uh, if this is a piece of butter, stick of butter. If this rotates about the positive x-axis, it starts out with land lakes on the front. And after it rotates nine, positive 90 degrees, land lakes is on the bottom. Okay. Positive rotation about y, your thumb is in the y direction. Uh, so the rotation is like this. And so it starts out with land lakes in the front. And after 90 degrees, Land of Lakes is on the side. And then positive V, your thumb's in that direction. So the rotation is in the plane of the page like that. Um, just like in 2D, along an axis okay. translation along an axis is prevented by force component along that axis. Uh, so in the butter example, if if you had an object that's free to move along Z, it's free to move along Y, but it's restricted along the x-axis, then that means that whatever joint that is is applying a force with an X component and no Y and Z component. Okay. Again, it's the restrictions that provide the loads, not the not the freedom to move. Okay. Um, and just like in 2D,
rotation about an axis. is prevented by a couple uh, parallel to that axis or prevented by a couple components along that axis. Um, in 2D, for couples, we've only had to deal with one axis up until now. It's all, only been Z components. And so um, I've drawn represented couples with that, you know, circular arrow telling you which way it's rotating. But notice that that would get sort of cumbersome now. Um, if we had, like, so if this was our coordinate system, and that's X, Y, and Z, um, we'd have to put in these multiple multi-directional uh, rotation symbols to represent the different axes of rotation. Okay. So that's cumbersome. We don't want to do that. So instead, from now on, we're going to represent um, components with double arrows, I guess, probably for an arrow, you know, two arrows represent the two forces of a couple. This is a positive x component of a couple. This is a positive y component of a couple. And this is a positive z component. And I'll represent these, you know, like mx, my, mz. Okay, so in 3D, don't, don't mess with those, uh, those uh, circular arrows just represent a couple components with the double arrowheads. Okay, so here's a list of 3D joints. So first, point category one. Um, so these apply um, force in a known direction. And therefore, since we know the direction, that just introduces one variable into our equations, into Newton's laws. So it brings one variable into Newton's laws. Um, the first point of this type is frictionless contact. Um, and uh, that would be represented the same way it is in 2D. So if this is body one and this is body two, a free body diagram of body one,
would look like this. And a free body diagram of body two would look like this. And Newton's law, uh, Newton's third law says that those forces are the same magnitude. So you can call them both N. And the second type in this category, and there's only, this is the last one, uh, is a roller. And now in 3D, we have to make a distinction between different types of rollers. Um, some rollers have a preferred direction, like a wheel with some kind of friction on it. It's harder to slide it to the side than it is to roll it forward. So this one, I'm talking about a roller uh, with a ball, not a wheel. Okay, so there's no preferred direction. Um, that's body one and body two. Uh, it works the same way as a frictionless contact. So if, ah. If the ground is oriented like this, then the force is perpendicular to the ground. I'll call that N. And then uh, if you're isolating the ground in this picture, it's equal and opposite. Um, one thing to notice about these is just like pushing contacts uh, in two dimensions, we know the direction that a pushing force applies to an object, and so th those end values have to be positive. Okay. So N must be positive for both of these. So if you ever get an N in a problem like this that's negative, something went wrong somewhere. Um, joint category two, I'll do this one and then I'll stop it. This feels like a lot of talking and stuff today. Um, joint category two. What? That was joint category one. Okay, the, these are both members of joint category one. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, uh, uh, yes, thank you. I'm just trying to show how that joints load appears in the free body diagram. So uh, joint category two. Um, there's only one of these, and uh, this applies forces in two directions. And so it introduces 
two variables into Newton's laws. Um, and the only one of these is um, a wheel with a preferred direction. Um, so here we have something like this. Okay, and that wheel is free to roll along that line but it's restricted from moving side to side. So it doesn't slide side to side. Anyways. Um, I'm just gonna Draw a free body diagram of this one. All the um, free body diagrams of all the body twos are just following Newton's third law. You know, they're just equal and opposite. A free body diagram of member one. Uh, it doesn't restrict motion along this axis. Free to roll that way, but it doesn't let it slide side to side. Um, it doesn't let it, it would let it jump up in the air, but it doesn't let it sink down, so it restricts motion in that direction. And what about rotations? I guess it depends a little bit on which, on how this joint is constructed for some of it, but for sure we can agree that it's free to rotate this way, it can tip over. If you've ever been on a unicycle, you know that. Um, and it's free to tip side to side like a unicycle. And if these are both metal or something, in a lot of cases, I'm going to treat it like it's also free to spin. Okay. And so, uh, what kind of loads are applied? All three rotations are allowed, so there's no couples. Um, there's no force component along the line of motion because it's free to move that way. But there is a force pushing up like that. And there is a force perpendicular to the, let's, let me see if I can get this across. Okay, so, um, There's a force component that way, a force component that way. We could call this a normal force and call this a, you know, whatever, F. And then those are the two forces introduced. And in most cases, you'll have those lined up with your coordinate system to make it easier to deal with. But if it's not lined up with your coordinate system, then you can just do these two with unit vectors. What? Um, I can sort of show it with this. That's right. Yep. Um, so, Kind of like this, this is free to move in one direction. Okay. So that force F keeps it from going. If I try to push it towards you right now, it won't go or away from you. Okay. So that's that force F, keeping it in that line. Okay. Any other questions about that? All right, let's stop there and I'll finish next time. <laughs>